Greetings one and all, and I'm Keith DeCandido. And I'm Andrea Lipinski, and welcome to a special episode of The Chronic Rift. Tonight we're putting aside the usual format for a very special all-interview show where we'll have three interviews with people in the science fiction and fantasy and comic book fields. We begin with author Thomas Dish, who couldn't be with us tonight, but he came in the other day to tape this interview segment with us. Thomas M. Dish was one of the new wave of science fiction writers, authors who started publishing in the mid to late 1960s. Like most movements that are proclaimed as changing the face of the genre forever, the new wave fizzled out around the 70s, leaving its members to go back to being writers rather than being heralds of a new age. Dish has not limited himself to SF. His prolific career has seen him writing poetry, such as The Right Way to Figure Plumbing and the recent Dark Verses and Light, children's books like The Brave Little Toaster, which was made into a movie, Libretti for theater versions of The Fall of the House of Usher and Frankenstein, plays such as Ben-Hur, and other science fiction novels such as the classic Camp Concentration, which he published in 1968. His latest is The M.D., a horror story, which is on sale right now, this minute, in bookstores from Knopf at $22 in hardcover. It tells the story of an exceptionally bright young boy who acquires the power of the caduceus, which is best known as the symbol of the medical profession, which you saw on the cover of the book, and it follows him to adulthood in 1999, where he used the, the absolute power that the Caduceus gives him to wreak havoc, sort of. Anyway, welcome to the show, Tom. Glad to be here. Um, in the part of the book where you get to 1999, um, where Billy has grown up into Dr. William, um, you have some very interesting ideas there about how religious authority is, becomes over the next eight years. Could you, could you explain a little of how you came about your, your ideas for that? Well, there is a um, interactive television network in the country uh, that allows a televangelist to work in the way uh, that nowadays you would put a disc into the computer and you would be interactive with it. Uh, interactive live TV hasn't happened yet. Uh, it could be coming, and when it does, uh, people like Jimmy Swigert or Jim Baker will have a lot of use for it. What about the splits in the Catholic Church that you that you had? Oh, the splits in the Catholic Church uh, that are in the novel already have happened. Uh, the uh, there's that man in Washington D.C. who has the the new uh, schism of the black Catholic Church in the country. Uh, well, I've just supposed that that, that that will continue and that there will be uh, an equivalent white uh, schism, uh, a separatist movement, uh, because so many of the Catholics in the country disagree with what the church is doing. Uh, so, uh, I've just supposed that that's going to go on happening. Um, about the subtitle of the book, A Horror Story, uh, when I first picked it up, I was expecting sort of blood and gore and Edgar Allan Poe and Lovecraft. Can you explain um, what well, the Well, there's subtitle? a certain amount of blood and gore. It is, a, <laughs> uh, as it says, it's the M.D. Mm -hmm. And by the time the M.D. is done, there are a few medical operations and some rather grisly surgeries happening. Uh, so for people who require uh, actual blood and literal guts, there'll be plenty of that. No, I don't require it. Um, <laughs> it's just sort of the, the title, um, uh, A Horror Story. I was wondering if you were trying to reach a particular kind of reader and say, well, this is not a science fiction story. No, this is no, I've done, uh, this, this is the second of three books I mean to do. The first was called The Businessman, A Tale of Terror. Mm. The next one is called The M.D., A Horror Story. And the third one takes up, which has not been written yet, mm -hmm. but the third one takes up another profession and it will be called The Priest, Gothic Romance. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, what they have in common is that they're all set in the same supernatural Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and these books 
are set there and each one of them has its own particular handle on an aspect of supernatural existence or belief. Uh, the first one had to do mainly with the afterlife mm -hmm. and ghosts and such as that. And this one has to do uh, not with the afterlife, but with something that people really believe in probably more than they believe in any other supernatural element, which is the power of faith to heal mm -hmm. and correspondingly to blight, to kill, to hurt. Uh, people believe in that element of the supernatural probably more than in any other because the supernatural always has to do with what people fear. Now, people fear death, and the first book was about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. But what they fear more than they fear death is what they can imagine happening that could hurt them. Mm -hmm. And that is disease and pain. And that is what this book is about. You mentioned faith um, in the book. There are a lot of questions of faith and of belief and of a child believing in Santa Claus or believing in the god Mercury or believing in, in the Christian god or believing, or believing in Brother Orson. Or believing in Brother mm -hmm. Orson. Faith is a very interesting thing. Uh, it, it has to do with what I was talking about, what people, the, if you want to be cured, what they have, what they tell you, is you got to believe. Mm -hmm. If you've really got the power of faith, then maybe you can cure yourself. That's the crucial thing. You have to have the faith. Now, this, the hero of this book, is a child who manifests his faith by insisting that he believes in Santa Claus, and his kindergarten teacher, uh, Sister Simferosa, mm -hmm. tells him that Santa Claus is a pagan myth, and he can't believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, now this boy believes in Santa, and he goes on believing, and he defeats Sister Sinferosa. Mm -hmm. uh, and Santa appears to him spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a, a direct meeting with Santa Claus, but maybe he isn't just Santa Claus. Right. Uh, and. Billy's whole story is about the power of his faith. And I think everybody th believes that faith has that kind of power. And so the two things fit together. First it's Santa Claus, and then it's something else. But as long as your belief keeps getting confirmed by what happens when you're a kid, your belief is confirmed by the fact that Santa brings you presents. And he does, so you've got to believe it. That's, that's, that's something that you also dealt with in the book, is about how faith changes and how religions change. And in a sense, it's like the old gods don't die, they just sort of change their names. You know? um, Mer I mean, the god that is, in essence, Mercury in the book appears as Santa Claus, he appears as Brother Orson, he appears mm -hmm. as Mercury. And it's sort of a, a, an interesting idea you carry through that the, the faith is still the same, it's just the names that change. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, another aspect of that is that uh, all of this begins in the year 1973 uh, uh, when Nixon was in office. Mm -hmm. There was an awful lot of people who believed in Richard Nixon. And I always thought that that was very much like believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> that grown-ups who could believe in Richard Nixon had to have the same kind of really childish faith, and in a way it's touching. In a way, a grown-up who can believe in Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan seems to me uh, like a child. And in a way that's admirable, uh, everybody respects the faith that children have, but when you grow up, you also understand that that, that faith is also a kind of credulity. And this book is about the double edge of faith. 
that when you're believing in something that you think is very good, it could also be something very bad. And uh, I think Richard Nixon was that kind of faith. And I think Ronald Reagan was that kind of faith. And it turns out in this case that the Santa Claus that our hero originally believes in is also Mercury and he's also probably the devil and you got to watch out what you believe in. You bring out the, uh, the extremity of faith in the character of Judge and other mm -hmm. characters sometimes say well yes you know you can almost admire it in a way aside from the fact that he's kind of psychotic you can almost <laughs> admire it mm -hmm. um, and he seems to I mean he d does seem to have very good intentions. He's an admirable character he is the hero of faith and uh, his heroes are Abraham and uh, uh, Jephthah. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a scene later in the book where he is discussing religion with a Catholic priest, mm -hmm. he talks about Jephthah, who's a very interesting figure in the Old Testament, who uh, made a vow that he, if he won, a particular battle that God was setting him to go fight, mm. uh, he would sacrifice the first thing that came out of the door of his house, and it turned out to be his daughter, mm. and he did. And in the Old Testament, he is not reprobated for what he does. Uh, he is applauded. Uh, he he lives to a good uh, long life, and he's one of the judges in the Old Testament, and. You uh, never hear about that story in the Old Testament. You hardly. don't. Not many people make a lot of it, but it is there, and I think it is one of the most interesting things in the Old Testament, and it is one of the crucial tests of faith. Even Abraham said he would kill his son, his son but then God at the last moment allowed him to make an animal sacrifice. Right. With Jephthah, that didn't happen, and in the MD, that doesn't happen. We have to cut you off there. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Horn is an artist whose work, uh, whose first paid assignment was a back cover of Heavy Metal magazine in 1982. Since then, his work has appeared on various book covers, including the Young Indiana Jones series, the Piers Anthony series Virtual Mode, the role-playing paperback series Legend of the Lone Wolf, by Joe Deaver, children's books such as Young Merlin, King Midas, and Black Arrow, and he was a regular cover artist for Dragon Magazine for five years. Um, Daniel, when you're given an assignment to do the artwork for a book, how do you approach it? How do you decide which scene you're going to illustrate? Well, sometimes um, the art director and the editors get together and they come up with a concept Mm -hmm. They go on the cover, and they'll uh, include that in you know, when they send me the manuscript. I'll read the manuscript to get the details, the costumes, what the characters are like, how they look, mm -hmm. and uh, then send sketches up to them. And then they'll either approve them or approve more changes, and then that, okay. take that to the finished painting. So you're always reading the manuscript yourself. They're not saying, we would like a picture of this. Well, uh, sometimes they're real specific. They'll say, there's a scene you know, that we'd like on the, on the book, but you still like to read the whole thing to know what happened before and after. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you can really catch the pace of it and see what's going on. Sometimes do they let you do a scene just wherever you think it would be appropriate in the book, or do they usually specify? Uh, probably one out of every ten assignments to get. Depends on the company you work with. Because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of mm -hmm. it's tied into marketing, you know, the images mm -hmm. that go on the cover. Is that preferable for you to have the choice? Or if, if you read a manuscript and they say, do... Um, please try to illustrate this scene. And you think to yourself, man, but the scene on page 53 was such a good scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of times. Uh, actually, it, it's easier if they choose a scene because then, you know, I, I can focus in on that because mm -hmm. on some books there are literally like hundreds of really neat scenes, mm -hmm. but you have to get to the one that will sum up the book. Mm -hmm. and, but look good on the cover, attract the viewer to want to buy the book. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how often, is there any particular preference you have either for doing, because some, sometimes cover artists will, won't do a specific scene from a book, but they'll do something that sort of sums up the essence of the book. Which do you prefer? Do you prefer take, lifting something directly or 
Uh, or does it vary from? Oh. Well, some stories just don't have a good scene. <laughs> the one that, that's, that's will be on, been on the cover. Um, but I, I like to get a scene that's in the book, so when a reader comes across it, they can flip it up and say, ah, that's it, okay? And that, that helps them you know, visualize the story. Mm -hmm. So, but um, sometimes when you're given an assignment to uh, just that sum up the, the, the book, um, you can get a little more creative with it because you're not restrained by or restricted by what's actually in the text, you know, so you can mm -hmm. expand upon it. Do you have particular, um, you work with fantasy a lot, do you have particular um, creatures or types of people that you prefer illustrating? I like, um, I like dwarves and I, I love monsters, they're just uh, <laughs> a lot of fun because it, it's really challenging because you get to, what I like to do with, with my creatures is, um, is make them as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Part of what I like to do is, when you, when you look at my art, uh, hopefully you'll, you want to take a second look because I try to make it as realistic and as close to nature as, as it can. Mm -hmm. um, I think George Lucas, there was an interview with him I read in the magazine, and they asked him, why do you go to such pains with the little detail, little braids and hairs and that? And he said, because everything has to be real to, to last a tale or else you won't, it won't be believable. And that's what I try to do with my work down to. Um, that the smallest costume detail, I'll research it and sketch it and make clay models of, of creatures. Mm -hmm. um, I make my own armor, chain mail, swords, any, anything that I need, mm -hmm. I make. You, know. hmm. you, um, you studied in what's I believe called the Brandywine School. Yeah, it was, you know, what is that exactly? Well, it's not so much a school, it's more of a, a school of thought. Right. Of illustration was started by uh, an illustrator named Howard Pyle around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. He formalized uh, um, illustration that as, as we know it now of uh, good storytelling being truthful to the, the author's text uh, researching and, and making the characters come alive you know not just like, standing there mm -hmm. with costumes on but real flesh and blood people you mentioned um, making your making your illustrations seem real but to some people who didn't grow up with uh, fantasy and science fiction. They might say, oh, what are you talking about? Make it real. These are unicorns. These are centaurs. They're not real. Uh, how would you? Well, a lot of, a lot of what I do is, is try to give uh, people, especially kids, um, uh, a place. Um, and with adults, uh, a place to go to look at my work and hopefully they'll forget about that the taxes are due just for a minute. You know, it's that's what's real satisfying. I get a lot of uh, mail from young kids um, saying, gee, I really liked your monster on the cover of something. And, and that, that means so much because, uh, first of all, kids never write and, to, and for yeah. something to, to mean that much to them. So trying to make um, the fantasies and, and the creatures believable so you can identify with them. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, monsters and that uh, painted, and they're just so fantastic and have, have, have no basis in reality that you can't identify with them. Mm -hmm. I always try to make something that you can identify with. Whether, if it's a dwarf, then I think of someone that I know, um, an, an older man that I've seen on the street or some, you know, something to try to instill you know, a real character. They say, ah, oh, my, my Uncle Joe looks like his name is just like that. Right. That's, 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 that's the fun thing about it. Um, fantasy illustration, it really is. So, um, when you were on Dragon, um, those covers weren't really necessarily based on anything, were they? No, uh, as long as long as uh, you know, I use some of the characters that were in the stores. Mm. Okay, and we have to cut you off there. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, Andy Helfer has been editing at DC Comics for about rough, roughly ten years. He has, at some point or other, worked with pretty much every character in the DC pantheon. He's also a writer, occasionally. He has written such series as The Shadow and Justice, Inc., which were both quite good. And lately, he has been promoted to the grandiose title of editor in charge of experimental projects. One of those experimental projects has already been going on for a couple of years, Piranha Press. Originally under the tutelage of Mark Nevelo, this has been an outlet for more creator-owned or at least creator-inspired visions that aren't really connected to the DC universe. Um, Andy has taken over Piranha Press and assigned a new editor to replace Nevelo, who resigned. And he's also going to be doing the experimental projects. Welcome aboard. Um, first thing would be, what 
if anything, or what, what are the plans for the new Piranha Press? Well, uh, the plans for the new Piranha Press are to um, create material that will uh, reach people who do not necessarily read comics at this moment. Um, we found, I found that uh, after uh, selling Piranha Press in the comic book shops, um, the comic book shops have become more superhero shops than comic book shops. Um, they are places where people come to get their fix of superhero stuff, and that's fine, that's great. I mean, I, God knows I, I've, I've uh, worked with the superheroes long enough, but what we're looking for is to get people who don't read superhero, who don't read comic books currently, to read comics, and they're not going into the shops. So what we're looking to do is get into bookstores with these books and um, hopefully introduce people who have never, or perhaps when they were kids, read comic books, but have essentially never read comic books before. Um, the material that we will be coming out with, uh, as far as Piranha stuff goes, will uh, be the first step. Uh, in other words, things will appear in serial serialized form in the comic book form and will be compiled and be reproduced for the bookstore. In some cases, we will circumvent the exclusivity of the comic book stores totally and go directly simultaneously to the comic book shops and the bookstores. Um, uh, there are currently plans afoot for four separate lines uh, of different uh, kinds of books. Um, Two of them, <laughs> well, most of them are secret right now. Oh, okay. So okay. Work. <laughs> uh, is there, um, I noticed in Piranha there was a, under, under Nevelo, there was a combination. Some of them were people who were known for their mainstream work, like Kyle Baker, who worked with you on The Shadow, mm -hmm. who did Why I Hate Saturn, William Messner Lopes, who does the Flash comic book, doing Epicurus This Age. Is there going to be more of that? Is this going to have a lot of mainstream artists who are deciding to do something different, or are you going to try and bring people in from the alternative press, or people who were never involved with comics? Or A, a combination of all those things, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we're thinking of right now is that um, in, the, in the bookstores, the name of the uh, writer, or the writer's work, previous work, is very important. Uh, you know uh, various novelists and science fiction and horror and mystery and whatever uh, and you go to the bookstore to buy their books based on their names uh, you don't know anything as a book as a bookstore goer uh, you don't know anything about the comic book artists um, in the comic book shops the artist is the thing that the people go to, to buy and so uh, they are they're almost mutually exclusive um, uh, and so we hope that by taking known writers and known comic book artists, we can, you know, get both, the best of both worlds. We'll see how that works. So you have, uh, we, you we have, have been, We have been in contact with a lot of uh, mainstream novelists in different genres, uh, and we hope to be uh, doing work with them. Uh, most of the, the focus right now, on my own personal interests have been with mystery writers, uh, but uh, uh, they're all very, a lot of them are very interested in, in doing comic book work, uh, and we'll see what happens with that when it comes down to signing on the dotted line and right. change. But, uh, what other experimental projects are you going to be the editor of? Well, um, being necessarily vague right now. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a vague title. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Mm. Uh, one of the things that, we're, we, that I really am anxious to do is a kid's line. I'm anxious to uh, do for kids of the 90s what Mad Magazine did for me in the uh, 60s, uh, which is basically told me to disrespect authority, <laughs> and that the things I, I was told by my authority figures weren't necessarily true, and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it had a profound effect. If anything, comic book, uh, Mad Magazine if, was, affected me more than comic books or famous monsters of film land or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and I think that there really is a, a need uh, for challenging kids' material out there today. Uh, I think most of this stuff kids get is fed to them by a machine that creates properties to feed to kids. It's uh, uh, from the turtles on to, well, that turtles is the most recent manifestation, but it goes all the way back to probably Masters of the Universe, I think was the first manufactured phenomenon, yeah. um, multimedia madness. Uh, the other thing I want to do, and this uh, is uh, fairly vague necessarily, <laughs> is Once again. a, a nonfiction comics line. Um, the Piranha Line and uh, a uh, scaled-down trade paperback uh, 
line of graphic novels that would be uh, equivalent in size to an average a rack size trade paperback what the not what the comic business calls a trade paperback but the book business calls a trade paperback um, trying to find the format that will be great for uh, uh, the non-comic book reading public and hopefully just get them into comics I mean it's the MTV generation you know <laughs> right. uh, if I say to a person that you can read a novel in four hours and get between the visual input and the reading input, you can get a novel's worth of information in a period of three hours. You know, maybe that's a plus. I mean, I, you know, we've often thought otherwise, but I think the time is right for uh, for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, for being with us. Uh, next week. Next next week. Um, well, it sort of depends. Uh, next week, if you are watching this on April 29th. Uh, next week we will be presenting finally our science fact episode which was preempted due to various circumstances beyond our control. So if you are watching this on April 29th, next week is science fact and science fiction which will feature authors Ben Bova and Charles Platt and it was a wonderful discussion and it's completely out of sequence but don't worry about it, it was good anyway. And if you're watching us in August then what you will be seeing is you'll be skipping right ahead to the Blake 7 episode, which will be our season finale, and we'll have pictures of us at Icon yes. schmaltzing with the famous science fiction types. Yes, the, the, the nifty science fiction people. Right. It'll just be, it'll be a slideshow, and then right. we'll talk about Blake 7. Okay. And that will be our season finale. And if it's August, that's next week. If it's April, it's in two weeks, and we'll see you then. Good night. Good night. But was sponsored in part by Comics Interview, the magazine where both the fans and the pros turn to see who's who and how it's done. For a free sample copy or a special discount on any Comics Interview publication, write to Comics Interview, 234 Fifth Avenue, Suite 301, New York, New York, 10001. Tor Books, a publisher of fantasy and science fiction books available at your local bookstore, including the currently available Days of Atonement by Walter John Williams and the soon-to-be-released Xenocide by Orson Scott Card on sale in August. Omega Zone, a store specializing in comic books and video movie rentals, located at 46 8th Avenue between West 4th and Horatio in Manhattan. Telephone 212 645 6941. Worlds of Wonder, fantasy and science fiction artworks, who exhibit and sell the best artists in the genre, including Dean Morrissey, James Warhola, Wendy Ross, J.K. Potter, and many others. For information about their catalog and video gallery, write to Worlds of Wonder, 3421. M Street, Northwest, Suite 327, Washington, D.C., 2007, or call 202-298-7889 and ask for Jane Frank. Mm -hmm.